Well, at this time, it is my distinct privilege to introduce your commencement speaker, the 39th President of the United States, the Honorable Jimmy Carter. James Earl Carter, Jr. was born in 1924 in Plains, Georgia. Peanut farming, talk of politics, and devotion to the Baptist faith were mainstays of his upbringing. Upon graduation in 1946 from the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, Carter married Rosalind Smith. We are pleased that Mrs. Carter is also with us today. After serving as a naval officer, then Mr. Carter returned to Georgia and entered politics in 1962. In just eight years, he was elected governor of Georgia. And in 1976, which I might add is the first election I was eligible to vote in, Mr. Carter was elected president of the United States. While in office, President Carter was responsible for numerous international accomplishments, including the Panama Canal Treaties, the Camp David Accords, the Treaty of Peace between Egypt and Israel. He was also responsible for the establishment of U.S. diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. On the domestic side, his administration's achievements included a comprehensive new energy program, major educational programs under a new Department of Education, and major environmental protection legislation. Today, President Carter remains active. He's actively involved in running the Carter Center here in Atlanta, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that has advanced peace and health in more than 70 nations. In fact, in 2002, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to Mr. Carter, and I quote, for his decades of entire, untiring effort to find peaceful solutions to international conflicts and to advance democracy and human rights and to promote economic and social development. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your commencement speaker, the 39th President of the United States, the Honorable Jimmy Carter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for that nice introduction. Early this week, I was interviewed by Suzanne Marveau with CNN for about an hour, and she showed her excerpts for that for all during the week. One of the most interesting things she asked me was, what is the best time of your life? Was it when you were a child on the farm, or when you were in the Navy, or a submariner, or was it when you were a state senator, or governor, or president? I said, no, it's now. And she said, can you explain it to me? And I said, well, I can explain it best by referring to a New Yorker magazine cartoon last year. This little boy is looking up at his father. He says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a former president. <laughs> well, I'm a former president. And it's a great honor for me and a pleasure to participate in this graduation exercise in a university that has become more important to me as the years go by. When I was uh, governor, I saw Georgia State's great contributions to our state, and I've seen its much greater potential realized in recent years. I never dreamed that you would have a football season and have a victorious season the first year you had a team. Also, Georgia State has done a great job of educating my children and my grandchildren, and two of them are in this class, and I'm very proud of them, and you helping them get through the curriculum. Also, when the Carter Center sponsored the Atlanta Project in 1990, Georgia State, with its special knowledge of the urban area here and your generic knowledge of urban affairs, was a key partner with us. We targeted 500,000 of the poorest and most destitute citizens of Atlanta. We divided them into 30 cluster communities. Each community had 25,000. 
and we recruited a major corporation and also a college or university to sponsor or to work with every one of those cluster communities. It transformed their lives. And I'll say that at the end of five years, 16 out of 20 had made major strides towards self-reliance, and Georgia State University adopted the other four and continued working with them. This great university endows its graduates with some of its unique attributes. Having attended four universities myself, I only graduated from one. Uh, I know that uh, graduation classes have their minds on things other than speeches. So I've decided to build my brief remarks around two illustrations, which a few of you, not many, will remember. First of all, is about a student who was kind of a wise guy. He thought he knew more than his professors. I'm sure none of you felt that way. And we had, he had a, a freshman physics examination. And the question was, how do you measure the height of a building with a barometer? And on his examination paper said, there's so many ways to do that, I don't know which you want. Well, so the professor gave him a failing grade and the student appealed to, to the professor. So the professor called him in and said, okay, you're such a wise guy. What do you mean by there's so many ways? He said, well, that's not the most accurate way to measure the height of a building with a barometer. I know that you can take it to the ground and you can take the atmospheric reading and go to the top of the building and take another atmospheric reading and you can compute the approximate height. And the professor said, that's right, that's all. And the student said, no, it's not. He said, you can also take the barometer, put it on the ground, measure its height, measure the length of its shadow, measure the length of the shadow of the building, and you can compute the height of the building. He said, that's approximately uh, correct, but there's a better way still. And the professor said, what is it? He said, well, you can take the barometer to the top of the building, take a stopwatch, drop the barometer, measure how long it takes to hit the ground, and you can compute the height of the building. He said, but that's still not the most accurate way. The professor was getting intrigued, but also aggravated. He said, well, can you tell me one more way? He said, yes, this is the most accurate of all. Take the barometer to the top of the building, tie a string to it, lower it to the ground, and measure the length of the string. <laughs> the professor said, well, you're a wise guy, right? I'm kind of equivocal. About that time, the dean of the college came by, and he was in the business school. So he listened to the argument back and forth, and finally said, okay, if you tell me something that applies to business, I'll get the professor to give you a good grade. He said, well, that's easy, sir. You take the, I'll take this nice barometer to the building superintendent, and I'll say, I'll give you this wonderful barometer if you'll look on the blueprint and tell me how high that building is. <laughs> well. The lesson to be learned from this story is that we need always to constantly stretch our minds and also to stretch our hearts, to explore new ideas and not to be bound by custom. That's one illustration. The other one is an account of the most um, important and the most, um, I would say, unforgettable interview of my life, which took place exactly 60 years ago, in 1951. Admiral Rickover had decided that nuclear power could be used to propel ships. It was a top secret idea. And Rickover and all the Navy was looking for two young officers to head up the planning program and to develop two nuclear power plants, one using liquid water to go in and bring out the heat, and the other one to use liquid sodium to go in and bring out the heat. So every young submariner in the Navy wanted these jobs. So he called me in for an interview. He was sitting in a very luxurious chair behind a big desk, and I was sitting on the straight chair in front of him. All the legs were cut off of the straight chair. And I found out later that the two front legs were cut off two inches shorter than the front, than the back legs. So I felt like I was sliding off a chair all the time he was interviewing me. 
So he began to ask me one question after another about current events, and I thought I was very knowledgeable about current events, so I began to give him answers. And every time he asked me questions so advanced that I couldn't answer. And he asked me about literature. What books have you read? And I said, oh, I read all kinds of books, Admiral. He said, well, just give me an example. So I would give him an example. He would ask me question after question until he proved that I didn't know anything about literature. Then he turned to music. He said, Lieutenant, what uh, kind of music do you like? So I like country music. I like classical music. Ah, what kind of classical music? I would say, trying to think, uh, opera. What operatic composer is your favorite? And I thought about Wagner. I said, Wagner. What's your favorite one of Wagner's uh, operas? Tristan and his soldier. What's the name of the final movement? I didn't know then it was Liverstone. So I was in a cold sweat. And finally he asked me a question. I thought I could maybe redeem myself. He said, how do you stand in your class at the Naval Academy? And I swelled up with pride. I had done fairly well at the Naval Academy because I finished my second year at Georgia Tech before I went to the Naval Academy. So I said, sir, I stood so and so in a class of 865. I didn't make any impression on him. He looked at me. I found out later he stood number one in his class. But then he said, did you do your best? And I thought about the time I was at the academy. Our country was at war. And I spent a lot of time listening to music, reading books. I would go across uh, the other side of the bay, and I would learn how to fly airplanes. And I didn't know what to say. And finally, I looked at him and I said, no, sir, I didn't always do my best. And he stared at me with cold eyes. And finally, he said, why not? I sat there for a long time. And then he turned his chair around to end the interview and began to work on some papers on a table behind. And I finally got up and stumbled out of the room. I got the job, probably because I told him the truth. I didn't always do my best. The answer to this question should apply to our personal lives and also to the society in which we live. I'm grateful for my military and political careers, and I'm grateful to the nation that our children will lead during some difficult years. Americans have always been justifiably proud of our country. The realization of our forefathers' dreams. But I have to say that uh, our people have utilized America's great natural resources, access to warm oceans, relatively friendly neighbors, a heterogeneous population, and a pioneering spirit to strive constantly for a more perfect union. Now, more than any other time in history, the United States of America is the preeminent military power on Earth. There's been a downward trend in worldwide expenditures for the military for the last 20 years, but the United States has continued to increase its military budget. It now exceeds those of the next 20 nations. The second largest military budget is China's, which is just one-sixth as large as ours. So the only arms race is one that we are having with ourselves. One reason for this enormous expenditure of funds is that 300,000 of American troops are stationed in more than 120 countries with military bases in 63 of them. And since I left office, American presidents have used these military forces in combat about 50 times in foreign countries. 14 of these have been major engagements. It's good to know that our defenses against a conventional attack are impregnable and imperative that America remain vigilant against threats from terrorists. I'm particularly proud as a Navy man of the Navy SEALs. In addition,
In addition to supplying our own military forces, America's arms manufacturers and those of our allies now provide 80% of the weapons sales in international market, 80%. We are therefore assumed to be the world's superpower. But as with a human being, a nation's admirable characteristics are not defined by physical prowess. Look into the future America that you will shape, your graduates. We might ask, what are the characteristics of a superpower? Once again, they might well mirror those of a person. It would include a demonstration, commitment to truth, peace, justice, freedom, human rights, generosity, and utilizing the innate characteristics or, or talents of every citizen. There is no inherent reason that our powerful country cannot be the international paragon of these virtues. Whenever any people in any country face a challenge or a problem, they should naturally look to Washington as a partner or as a sterling example. Our government should be known as opposed to war, champion of peace, dedicated to the resolution of disputes by peaceful means, and whenever possible, eager to exert our tremendous capability and influence to accomplish this goal for others. At this time, however, many see us as the most warlike of nations. We should be seen as the unswerving champion of freedom, democracy, and human rights, both among our own citizens and within the global community. All too often, though, the United States has been in bed with dictators. For political or economic advantages, yes. In Latin America, in the previous century, and more recently in the Middle East, America should be the focal point around which other nations of all kinds could marshal to combat threats of global warming and to enhance the quality of our common environment. We are now one of the most recalcitrant in dealing with this major challenge. We should be in the forefront of providing humane assistance to people in need, willing to lead other industrialized nations in sharing some of our great wealth with those that are destitute. Americans are surprised to know that we give less than one-fourth of one percent of our gross national product for humanitarian assistance. Another more recent development since I left office is that Americans now have a higher chance to be in prison than any other citizens in the world. 21 percent higher than Russia, which is second, and more than five times as great as the average country in the world. In addition, our people should be blessed with universal health care and a superb system of education. Our government our government should be fiscally responsible, not loading our children and grandchildren with burdens of our profligate indebtedness. I'm not criticizing or condemning the nation I served in the military and political office, which I really love. But to outline some of the combined challenges and especially opportunities that you face as future leaders. In achieving all these goals, our great country should strive to cooperate with other nations, most of which share these same fundamental ideals. We should also be willing to communicate with those who differ with us on some issues. Recently, for instance, I've been in Cuba and just got back from North Korea and in North Korea, we won't even talk to them. In achieving all these goals, our great country should strive to cooperate with other nations, most of which share these same ideals, as I said. There would be no real sacrifice in exemplifying these traits. Instead, our own well-being would be enhanced by incurring max maximum trust, admiration, and friendship among other peoples. At the same time, all Americans could be united at home in a common commitment to revive and nourish the historical, political, and moral values that we have espoused and for which we have struggled in the past two and a half centuries. As we constantly explore new ideas about how to use barometers to measure the height of a building, as well as about personal and national issues, 
we should also always ask ourselves the question that Admiral Rickover proposed to me as a young naval officer. Why not the best? Thank you.